Welcome back to Wargaming World and to a 30 minute video entitled How to Play the Men Who Would Be Kings. And so this very specific video is to go through this rule set and to cover off uh, 10 key points about how to play the game. So the idea being is that at the end of the 30 minutes you should be able to play the game all the way through and uh, get the best benefits of what is a really super rule set. So the approach to how we look at this game is to look at the, the rules themselves um, on uh, 10 key points and uh, on the video as we go through uh, it'll show which particular pages we're looking at or which key areas and uh, then you'll be able to uh, just pick it up and if you need to uh, refer back to different rules uh, the video itself shouldn't be too long so that uh, it should be easy enough just to uh, go back and forth uh, to look at various bits of rules and also on top of that I will split each point out so uh, it can be quite specific for you. Now first of all I'm going to uh, cover off the uh, rules using two forces so it's going to be a Zulu force which essentially described in the rules as a tribal force and a regular force which is the uh, British regulars of 1879. So let's start with point one, and that is that it's your game. And I, what I mean by that is uh, it just needs to be played in a way that's good for you. So the rules are fairly flexible, and that means that we can have uh, units of different sizes. It means the uh, base size can be different. It means that we can have uh, units which have to relate to uh, your opposition. But, again, we might have different sizes in terms of figures. We know that different manufacturers are, uh, are different, and we might try and add in you know, small uh, vignettes of figures just to uh, improve what the, uh, the game looks like. But at the end of the day, uh, you might play uh, two players, you might play solo, but it has to be so it's, uh, it's good and enjoyable for you. So the most important thing about the other nine points here is that we're not trying to be particularly prescriptive and instead just make it uh, common sense to you. So, point two is how do we work out what our forces are and how do we calculate that we have a balanced side for both? Well, we have uh, for that a point system and the points for both sides we start off at 24 points. Now at the back of the rule set there are a number of uh, scenarios and campaigns that give you ideas about what the size of different forces can be. However, uh, there are variations for each figure and that allows you to uh, improve them or indeed uh, reduce uh, their points value to give you a little bit more flexibility when you're looking at the force themselves. And so, using uh, this example, our Zulu forces, our basic uh, troops, our basic unit, would be three points, whereas our British regulars would be six points. In terms of the size of force, then the Zulu force is recommended to be 16 models. The regulars, on the other hand, are 12 models. And so what would happen if we had, say, 20 figures for the Zulus, or indeed uh, just 10 uh, for the British? Well, uh, the difference would be one we get to uh, firing and to fighting in terms of casualties uh, there it would potentially make uh, an impact however if we look at uh, uh, historical events naturally units weren't uh, exactly the same size uh, to fit to a war game and therefore the decision very much is up to you and so for this game you would see that the Zulus now have eight units all at three points and for the British, uh, using the uh, Wargaming World dice uh, marked as a six, we have four units at six points each. So both armies, therefore, are now 24 points. OK, so now we're at point three. And point three is a critical part of the game, and it's that of the role of the leaders. Now every unit 
as a leader. Now before we start the game, uh, we roll for characteristics and traits which may be beneficial or certainly a hindrance of each unit. Now the reason why this is so important is because each unit, so our eight units for the Zulus and our four for the British, will start with a leadership level. So if you don't have a leader, if your unit doesn't have a leader, its leadership level will be eight. And then through the game we will need to take tests to see whether it actually follows the actions that it's required uh, to uh, uh, play uh, to play the game. I'm going to come on to that in a moment. Now for the leaders, uh, we'll roll to see what their leadership level is and then we'll also roll to see what their trait will be and to see whether that might improve or hinder the forces. So first of all we roll for the leadership value and this is for our regulars, irregulars or tribal troops. So let's go through the process as if it's our two leaders here, one Zulu and one British. Let's roll the blue dice and red dice uh, for the two forces. And we see a four for each. You can see on here that for the regular uh, officer, that means we have a leadership of six. And exactly the same for the tribal leader is a, a leadership of six. However, we then have a list of traits. So we roll two dice. So I'm going to roll a red dice for the first column and a green dice for the second column and we'll see what trait they have. So let's start with our British officer. So we have a one and a five. And so by that we'll see that officer is a weakling and we roll no dice for the leader in melee. And for our Zulu leader, a five and a three. Now with a five and a three it just describes him as a damn fine fellow. Nothing more and nothing less. So we don't add anything or take anything away. And so, throughout the whole process, we then do the same for all of the officers, uh, both Zulu and British, and take a note about how that will then affect them during the fighting. So we've now taken a look at the leaders and the forces themselves. So the next question is to say, how do we actually act? What are the actions that our forces undertake. Right, so through uh, each game we play a turn. Now it is a an I go, you go turn process and as we go through the game we play an action for each particular turn. And there are two types of actions. There are free actions or actions that we must take a test to see whether they will actually be undertaken by each unit. Now there are 10 actions that are undertaken by the forces uh, which are at the double, attack, fire, form close order, go to ground, move, rally, skirmish, stand to or volley fire. Now I'm not going to go through each one, I'm just going to go through the principal areas in terms of uh, moving, firing, fighting. But what's important is that we need to understand that sometimes we have a free, a free action and some that we have to take a test. So let's give an example then of a free action for the Zulus and the British. So a free action for our Zulu forces is to move. They don't need to take a leadership test in order to do so. The British, on the other hand, can take a free action to fire, so they don't need to take a test in order to do so. However, what's important is, is that we have one action, either free or um, one we have to take a test for uh, each, uh, each turn, unless, of course, one of the traits allows you to do more than one in any given turn. Now I've mentioned that we can take free actions. What does it mean to take actions that are not free? So you'll remember that we uh, rolled for the leadership of both forces and we have a leadership of six. So therefore that was for the two officers here at the front. And so if we needed to move, for example, the British unit at the front, we would need to take a leadership test and we would need to get six on 2d6 or higher. For the Zulus on the other hand, 
If, for example, they were armed uh, with rifles and they wanted to fire, they themselves would have to take a test in order to fire. Now, I might think, is it possible to improve our odds and make that uh, situation better? And the answer is, uh, yes, it is. Uh, we can improve our individual units with the options that we've got in terms of the forces right at the start. So, in the game itself, this is a the British unit, which is a, a regular infantry unit. We can spend some points in terms of improving that situation. So, for example, we might spend one point to say that these are elite forces, and then our discipline is improved by two. So on that test that we have to do in order to move, this time we need to get a four rather than a six with the roll. However, if it means that we're going to spend a point and go above our 24 points, we need to deduct a point from one of the other units. And so you can see there are some options we've got there as well. They might be a poor shot or unenthusiastic or poorly armed. So therefore, as long as we balance it at 24 points, we can amend the units. Can we do the same with the Zulu units? Well, yes, we certainly can. Uh, we can improve them to be uh, elite forces, uh, they can be veterans, or indeed they can be unenthusiastic themselves. So we've got the same flexibility. Uh, it's not quite as many options, but certainly for our Zulu force, we can make these uh, amendments as well and see how we might uh, improve some of the units when we think about the strategy we're going to use in order to win the game. Now at this stage we've thought about how the game is set up, what our leaders look like, what our forces might be, how we might, might amend them. So uh, I'm going to uh, set the game up now to see what situation would be if we get into uh, a battle situation and then we can go through the other points having a look at firing, fighting and the uh, rallying and pin tests that follow to see how we get the results at the end of the game. Point five is movement, and I've used the beautiful illustrations of the book uh, to show our tribal cavalry, for example, which is 12 inches for standard movement. Then we have irregular cavalry, again, that's 12 inches. And then we have our regular cavalry, and regular cavalry is 10 inches. Then we move to our infantry, so we start with our Zulus, our tribal infantry, which is 8 inches as standard. Then regular and irregular movement is six inches and finally we've got our gun crew and gun crew movement is four inches in total. So you can now see that we're in uh, a, a phase of play. The uh, Zulus are attacking. Uh, they've already uh, moved past early units and you can see that we've got some uh, casualties here as the Zulus advance. We can also see that there's been some slight changes on the numbers. So on the British we've spent uh, 8 points. So our 24 points are reduced in terms of we only have 3 units. And the Zulus uh, still have 8 but we've made a slight change. We have uh, one which is a fierce fighter unit on the left hand side. We have one which is uh, somewhat unenthusiastic. It's a larger unit. I said we don't have to keep it to uh, 16 figures, so we've got a larger unit here, but it's an unenthusiastic force. However, all of them are moving forward, because as far as the Zulus are concerned, then uh, they don't need to take a test to move. And uh, we've just moved within uh, shooting range of the British. So we've moved within 16 inches. And so the first thing to point out is that we've got two ranges with uh, regular fire. Uh, so uh, regular uh, rifles will uh, fire uh, a maximum of 24 inches. Short range is 12 inches. So here we're shooting uh, for the British at long range. And so how do we fire? Well, if we remember, the British don't need to take a test in order to fire. Uh, that's one of their free uh, orders. So they can fire, but as they fire towards their target, the Zulus here, when we uh, fire, uh, we need to roll and get a 5 to hit. So it's a 5, and when we uh, hit the target, then uh, there isn't another roll in terms of uh, whether it's uh, to uh, cause a casualty, but we need to get two dice, two fives, to uh, reduce the uh, figures uh, by one uh, at uh, long range 
and if it's going to be an odd number so if we only get five we round down so it would only be two casualties so let's see how the British go on so first of all let's fire uh, the units uh, under uh, under Bromhead uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the colours so we need fives to hit and so we have uh, four casualties uh, the black dice is for the uh, officer uh, who missed we've got four but that means that's two casualties so it's two men uh, killed now we need to test if the leader is one of the casualties and the only way that can happen is if we roll uh, when we take casualties and we get a double one so let's uh, test it here is it the leader and no it isn't. So I've marked that I've got uh, two casualties but the immediate thing we need to test here is a pin test to see if the unit will stop advancing. Now I've taken a, a test for the individual in terms of their leadership and their leadership is five and there are no traits uh, which are a problem here so we have five but we've taken two casualties so we need to get a seven or higher just to pass that test. And with a nine, we pass, so we aren't pinned. And so with our second unit under charred, again we have fives. This time uh, with uh, an odd number, we only take one casualty. And we need to take another leader test to see if the casualty is the leader. No, it isn't. Now this time I'm going to say we have uh, a, a leader who isn't quite as good, so I'm going to say that they have the leadership of seven. So if we'd have rolled uh, originally and got uh, a 1 or a 2, it would have been a 7. And we've taken one casualty, so therefore it's a test of 8. So 8 required. But this time, this unit is pinned. So what's the consequence of these two units, one being pinned and one not? Well, obviously, it's that the one on the left-hand side can continue uh, to move forward and engage the British. But this one... In the next action, we'll have to take a rally test to see whether it can uh, continue to move on the subsequent turn. So it simply delays the forces moving forward. And so we've had the Zulu uh, turn and we'll see the two original units on the right and left hand side have advanced towards the British and they're very close. We have a third that have moved in now on the left flank but we need to take a rally test for the unit that took casualties earlier. And so this unit originally, so we have a leadership of seven, we already have one pin so we've got a marker and therefore we need to take a further test. But with a ten we pass. And so this unit's been delayed but not by a great deal. It can't move in this turn but can be activated next turn. Now I've shown you the uh, rally test first of all so that if we were the if it was the Zulu's turn here uh, then we would now be uh, charging into combat with those two units in front. So I'm going to separate out this point so uh, we're looking at close uh, close quarters and on the left hand side we're going to test um, out what would happen if it was the British turn first? So essentially, what does it look like when we're talking about volley fire? On the right hand side here, I'm going to do it as if it was a Zulu turn. So we're going to roll to see if we can make an attack and then we're going to go through a melee process. Now taking a look over here, first of all we're looking at the British and uh, we're looking at this particular unit and it's in close order. Now that's really important because close order makes an impact both in melee it improves their fighting capability and critically uh, it means that they can fire volley fire. Now uh, in order to do that you can only fire volley fire at short range but the Zulus are now eight inches away so they're certainly in short range and it means in terms of the, uh, the fire itself this whole volume of fire means that uh, it improves its capability so we're rolling for fours not for fives and indeed now in short range every casualty that they take is one figure per uh, casualty so therefore let's see what the roll would be and its impact. So, uh, we've got 12 needing fours and we've also got the officer as well so 13 in total. So you'll see it's a devastating uh, fire so we've got six casualties we're going to add that uh, to the leader so we need to roll to see if the leader was the casualty remember uh, but when we take six figures off then we need to do a pin test which will be five for the leadership plus six for the kills so we need to make an 11. Is it the leader? 
Uh, no, it's not. Zulus pass the uh, test, the pin test. Eight, no they don't, so they're pinned. So you can now see the devastating impact. We'd already lost two from this unit, if you remember, so we've lost six more. It's now halved in terms of the uh, group that started off. So we're down to eight men and we're pinned, so they're not moving forward. However, what would happen for the Zulus if they're now within uh, a reasonable distance in terms of attacking? And getting into melee so let's have a look at that uh, let's see what we need to do the first thing is uh, for any unit to attack we need to take a for our units we have a leadership of seven we're not to, we want to see whether they have the uh, yeah the up and atom spirit and whether they'll get into uh, contact with the british okay so let's take a test with our leader needing sevens uh, in order to uh, make this charge and yes we will so here we are our melee with uh, 24 Zulus uh, fighting 12 British. The British are in close order. We also have our leaders separate. So because we're in close order, it's going to help the British, so they're going to need fours. However, this is the point that I made right at the start of this video in terms of volumes and numbers. The Zulus need fives, but we have, well, 25, including the leader uh, attacking this unit. Roll this twice for the Zulus. 12 dice first of all. And that's five kills. We do it again with the officer also added. That's nine in total. Let's check if it's the leader. No, it's not. British needing fours. We'll throw the leader in as well. And that's six kills. Does that include the leader? No. And so the British have to retreat uh, a half move, so that's three inches. They take a pin test, but they would automatically uh, fail it because uh, we've hit, taken nine casualties. And uh, even with uh, good leadership and indeed elite forces, uh, we're going to uh, fail that test. So as a consequence, we've got one pin. The Zulus uh, in their next action may follow up and attack the British, or and the good thing is that they have the option is that they may then attack this British unit here. So for point nine, uh, I'm going to uh, highlight one or two of the uh, actions that we haven't used. I said right at the start of this I wouldn't go through all of them, but I think there's only a couple that we've missed. And so the first is that uh, if we see that British unit at the back there, it may look to uh, support the British in front of it, so therefore it may look to go at the double. So at the double is an option, uh, we need to pass a test and therefore we'll be able to move our original move plus an additional 1d6 if we pass that test. Say so our leader is a leadership of 5 and it's uh, passed so it can do its uh, at the double test. Let's roll that 1d6 and so they can move 6 inches plus an additional 2 and so the unit moves into position to bridge that gap. Now another action that they might uh, do in terms of the Zulus is they may not want to be uh, facing the unit who ultimately are firing volley fire. Now the unit in front of them, right in front, who were hit last time, they need to take a rally test. So we've no option but to take that. But we've got two units behind it. So these units may themselves want to go to ground. Now this uh, option can be taken by uh, tribal units and also units with uh, field craft. But essentially what's happening here is that they will go to ground on any terrain and just as long as it's beyond short range uh, they won't be able to be uh, shot at and uh, indeed they uh, somewhat disappear uh, from the enemy. And so we're finally left with two other actions and the first is Stand 2. Now Stand 2 really applies for those uh, forces who can't do anything at all i.e. they might be in a great position and you don't want to uh, move them they aren't going to fire and they just uh, continue doing what they're doing, uh, but uh, it's a free move to any force. However, there are some circumstances when it's useful, and one example would be when you go to ground, because when it comes to the next action we don't need to roll to uh, go to ground, it means that if we stand to we can just stay in that position and it's a free action. And the final action we've not talked about is to skirmish. So here we have uh, Zulu skirmishers. Now they may move half movement and they can fire uh, with uh, at half fire, but uh, they could do that at either or. So they could move first and fire or they could fire and move, certainly just to harass uh, forces in uh, perhaps a fixed position or all sorts of different uh, ways of, uh, of doing so. 
might work the other way around uh, in terms of uh, harassing uh, tribal forces and uh, that's uh, an option uh, that you can use and uh, they may be also useful in terms of being able to bring a larger force forward uh, by uh, screening them and uh, accepting that they're going to take uh, the casualties as they move forward. And finally, uh, point 10. So point 10 is really to make reference to uh, a number of things. The first is that there are some additional options, additional rules that we can do uh, which are included uh, in the game and uh, in fact the reality is that you can actually apply some elements of your own to the game so if you want some house rules or some ways to uh, play that uh, slightly differently in some of the videos that I've already put out uh, for the men who would be kings you uh, can see that I've played uh, phases where we have uh, double phases for uh, certain uh, forces and in addition, we've rolled a dice to see how many units can move. And in the book itself, uh, there are various different options we can uh, take. half size units uh, or leaderless units, things like that. And you can take that and uh, try and apply them to your own game. In addition, there are also a number of different scenarios. So the scenarios will give you different options about what to play. Different games, different ways of uh, playing the game, and uh, in all sorts of different theatres. There's also a number of different army lists that you can have a look at, and that will give you some options. All of the forces really are towards 24 points that I've mentioned already, but certainly if you want to have your own campaign and make it uh, different, then you can put, uh, well, basically whatever uh, points, numbers you like. Uh, after all, it is your game. And finally, I'd like to mention Mr. Babbage. So, Mr. Babbage is a part of the uh, book where it gives you an automated approach about how the uh, tribal forces will be uh, attacking uh, your European uh, troops. Uh, there are some really great uh, ways in which it plays, and therefore uh, it's designed for a solo player. And as all of the games that I play here on uh, The Men Who Would Be Kings are all solo, it's a great way of uh, adapting and changing the game that I play and uh, it really makes uh, the whole thing uh, an excellent game to, uh, to look at. Right, I think our half an hour is uh, almost up and our 10 points and I think we've covered everything. Just like to say thanks for watching. I uh, hope you've uh, enjoyed it. I hope you've got something out of the video. Uh, if you uh, liked uh, the video then uh, feel free to uh, have a look at uh, lots of other uh, the Men Who Will Be Kings uh, videos that I've uh, put out. Uh, there's a playlist of that in my YouTube channel. If you're not a subscriber, then uh, please subscribe. Help uh, build the channel, which is now building uh, beyond a 1,000 subscribers, and put in any comments or thoughts, either in the YouTube channel, or if you want to uh, go to the Wargaming World Facebook group, then uh, just uh, come and join that group, and uh, I look forward to your uh, thoughts and ideas. So... See you soon.